Well, thank you everybody for coming to my talk this afternoon on chemical evolution with combinators, a quadrant-centennial view. My name is Bob Nockbar, and I'm a member of Wolfram Solutions, the consulting department of Wolfram Research. I've been with the company almost uh, seven and a half years now after a long career in the pharmaceutical industry, and that probably explains uh, my interest in chemistry. Okay, as you've seen the abstract, my talk is broken down into three parts and I know I'll be, I'll be able to get through part one and I should be able to get through part two. We might not get to part three, but everything is in the notebook. Uh, so you'll have it for reference. The first part uh, basically gives the background about why I'm using combinators to, to model chemistry and, and how we can make it work. Uh, there was a bit of effort to get that to happen. And so that's why I, I have quite a bit of detail there. The second part of the talk is the use of the combinator based uh, molecules um, to do uh, genetic programming to try to evolve combinators uh, structures into uh, more useful uh, you know, their, their conversion into uh, molecule objects and then evolve that, that set of molecule objects into those that meet uh, desired criteria. And I'll be uh, trying to redo the experiments that I did about 20 years ago with the original implementation of molecules and genetic programming. Uh, the third part is a comparison of the uh, methodology with combinators to see how well they actually cover chemical space. And we can enumerate all possible chemical structures with a MageN software. And I will be comparing the results that we get with combinators against an exhaustive enumeration uh, that's possible with MageN. Uh, this part here, uh, we probably won't be able to get into, be more than happy to talk about it with you afterwards during one of the social uh, sessions. Uh, also, the um, very last slide of the presentation has all the initialization cells in it for the, the custom functions that I'm using during the presentation. Uh, there are also two notebooks or two packages that are loaded. They are available uh, from the Wolfram Cloud uh, with public permissions, and I'm actually uh, loading them from there uh, for today's presentation. And you can uh, load them from there as well uh, if you want to use them. Okay, so why combinators? Uh, almost a year ago now, Stephen Wolfram wrote a blog called Combinators a Centennial View. Uh, where he spoke about uh, the origin of combinators with Moses Schoenfinkel and how they were used to uh, model uh, logic computation. And we're not going to use it for logic, but he did make a connection uh, of the structure of combinators when they're written out in their associative form with what's called the Smiles chemical string notation. And let me just show you how that works. So we can enumerate all the combinators uh, of size four using the symbol S. These are the four of the, uh, the five of them at size four. And when we rewrite them as in application notation, Stephen noticed that they are just strings of S's or strings of S's with parentheses indicating the nesting. And that looks very much like um, the smiles notation we can take the uh, string notation, we can convert these uh, associate these application forms of combinators to strings. And then with a little bit of uh, rewriting, uh, replacing the S's by C for carbon um, and removing the association symbol, we, and leaving the parentheses in place, we end up with strings that represent chemical structures. And we can, give those to molecule and, and actually create molecules, which is really cool. So we can roll these steps up into a single function called two smiles. And we can try that out on our, enumer on our combinators. And lo and behold, we get some nice smile structures here. But wait a minute, a couple are missing. Um, for the four atom, molecules, we should also be seeing isobutane. And for the five atom ones, we should be seeing neopentane, namely these two structures here, they're missing. 
It turns out that rewriting the combinators in the left associative form actually loses some of the structural information uh, by eliding it with the uh, application symbol. So if we work directly with a smile with the combinator expression itself and convert it to smiles, uh, converting the square brackets to parentheses and the uh, S symbol to the letter C for carbon, uh, the extra parentheses that we get are really not a problem. And as we can see here, we now get isobutane. And if we do the five symbol ones or five atom ones, we also get neopentane. So, so we're just fine that way. So the um, recognition that, that uh, we could convert uh, combinators uh, into smile strings and therefore chemicals was a, a very keen insight on Stephen's part. And he did say in his blog post that, you know, it gives us access to tree like dendroburns, uh, possibly even being amenable to modeling with combinators. In other words, to have combinators because they are computable and there are rules that you can use where combinators basically rewrite combinators. We could think of combinators rewriting chemical structures as well. We did not get that far in the exploration of this work, uh, so we're not going to go there. But um, we, you know, we can make certainly uh, carbon-based molecules, but that's somewhat limiting. Uh, being able to just work with carbon or just tree-like structures, uh, branch structures, because chemists like to make rings and they like to use other atoms besides carbon. Uh, they also use uh, higher order bonds, double bonds and triple bonds that uh, are very common in chemistry. Uh, so it turns out we can actually address all of these uh, concerns uh, with uh, the combinator structure. And so the first part of the talk will cover how we do that. Uh, this table shows the number of possible combinators for the number of symbols. And this column over here shows the number of possible acyclic alkanes. Uh, this number can be computed with the um, uh, code in, at the end of the notebook uh, for the, um, uh, the sequence A000602 um, from the uh, Encyclopedia of Integral Sequences. And uh, so we can see that there are you know, many, many more combinators than there are uh, alkanes for a given number of symbols or a given number of carbon atoms. So there's a somewhat re some redundancy there. And just because there's redundancy does not necessarily mean that uh, all these combinators will actually map to all the possible alkanes. So we need to, to find out about that. So let's do that. And uh, we'll generate first all the alkane isomers up to size 10. There's a resource function here uh, called alkane isomers that actually does that. And we can see that if we count the number of isomers for each size from one to 10 carbons, we actually get the same sequence here. Okay. Now let's take the smiles, or excuse me, the S combinators uh, and generate the smile strings for those, the S combinators up to size 10 and convert those to molecules. Uh-oh, we've got a problem here. Um, we're getting some messages from molecule that there's invalid valence. Well, what's that all about? Let's pull out the structures that, that generated those messages and take a look at them. Takes a little bit of little while to do that because there are so many, but not too long. Okay. And here they are. Here's an example of the ones of size eight. And we can see we've got these star like structures here. And that's the problem. Uh, even the smaller ones here, this, the fir very first one, uh, six carbon atoms one at the center with five around it. And the problem is that combinators can have any arity, any number of arguments, whereas carbon atoms can have at most four singly bonded atoms attached to it. And uh, that's known as chemical valence. And to give a little background there, 
uh, for carbon atoms, we can have a single carbon atom with four single bonds or two single bonds and a double bond, uh, two double bonds or a single bond and a triple bond. That's what's allowed for carbon. For nitrogen, it's three single bonds, a double bond and a single bond or a triple bond only to the nitrogen. Uh, for oxygen, we have even fewer choices, two single bonds or one double bond. And for atoms like chlorine, fluorine, bromine, <clears throat> and hydrogen, there's only one choice, just a single bond, so just a lone single bond. So um, looking at just the molecules that were valid, do the uh, structures that we generated uh, of the combinators up to size 10, uh, do they actually cover all of the possible alkane isomers? So let's get the valid ones. We looked at the invalid ones. Here are the valid ones. We can see that there are many more molecules generated from the combinators that are valid than from the alkanes. So there's some duplication there. But first, let's see if there are any missing. So we're just going to do the complement for each size, each level here for the number of, of uh, carbon atoms, the complement of the uh, alkane isomers, and we'll remove all of those that were combinators, if there are any left, those would be ones that we missed. And we can see that we get an empty association, so we didn't miss any. And to be complete, we'll do the <clears throat> reverse complement. We'll take all of the valid alkane isomers and remove them uh, from the, the combinator generated ones to see if there were any extra combinator generated ones. And fortunately, that list comes out empty also. Takes a little bit longer here because there are a lot more <laughs> combinators that we need to eliminate. OK, so that, that list is empty. So this is good. Uh, it's not a rigorous proof that the combinators span the space, but it's a very good demonstration, at least up to size 10. And uh, we'll let that go for now. Um, we won't get approved. So back to the invalid valence problem. So the problem is we've got a single carbon atom here with more than four bonds attached to it. And rather than throwing away these structures altogether, is there a way that we can reuse them, uh, modify them slightly, preserving as much of the original structure as possible, um, <clears throat> and still satisfy valid chemical valence? And the answer is yes, we can do that simply by taking one of the uh, offending bonds and shifting it over to another atom where uh, there aren't so many bottom uh, uh, atoms uh, attached to it. Now, organic chemists tend to ignore the hydrogen atoms and we'll do the same thing here. The structures that we're working with don't have any explicit hydrogen atoms on them. And so this atom uh, in, in the, the way we've got it uh, coded doesn't has only one attachment to it back to here. So we can very easily move this carbon with its bond over here, basically doing a one, two shift as it's called a one, two alkyl shift. And structurally we can take this molecule here where we've got five uh, atoms attached to the central carbon and we can convert it to this one where there are only four atoms attached to this carbon, and one of them has been shifted over here. Now, we can do this pretty easily if we go back and use what I call the atom-rooted molecule structure that uh, we first developed uh, 25 years ago. And in fact, that's where the, the term quadrant centennial comes from uh, in the title of the talk. It was 25 years ago where we first devised the structure to uh, encode chemical structures in Wolfram language. And I gave a tech conference talk on it back in 1999. And this is a link to that. The atom-rooted molecule can represent all covalently bonded molecules, including cyclic ones, and those with uh, multiple bonds and uh, different kinds of atoms besides just carbon. And we can also model reactions with it just simply by using rewrite rules because 
the atom rooted molecule structure is a Wolfram language expression. And we certainly know how to write re, uh, rules to, to rewrite expressions. We can rewrite molecules the same way. So the idea is to convert the combinators to an atom rooted molecule or an ARM for short, and then have it spontaneously rearranged to valid valence. In other words, if we have an atom rooted molecule that looks like this, there's a rewrite rule uh, that will automatically convert it to something like this. That's, that's what we want to see if we can do. Okay, so the uh, package atom rooted molecules, which I've already loaded, um, has in it a few, few symbols. One's called molecule that is the container for a molecule. It has an atom at the root and then bonds attached to it. And the bond objects are things like single, which have an atom at the root and more pendant bonds. And so when one of these uh, gets inserted inside of molecule, it basically says this atom has a single bond back to the atom of its container. Uh, it's a hierarchical structure. Uh, in other words, it's a tree and it works fairly well. And we can easily convert this structure to a smile string as well. So we can create a, uh, a genuine Wolfram language molecule out of it. And so we can define a bunch of rules to do that. Um, and uh, I won't go into the details of that just to save time. So here are some examples. We can write the, the molecule propane as an atom rooted molecule this way. We've got a carbon with a single bond to another carbon and this carbon has a single bond to a third one. And we will convert that to smiles, we'll echo the smiles, and then we'll convert the smiles to a molecule. And we've got a valid, you know, a legitimate uh, molecule here of propane. I don't know why the 3D does not rotate. I'll stop trying to do that. Here's another example here, vinegar, uh, a, a carbon single bonded to a carbon with a double bond to an oxygen atom. And uh, this carbon also has a single bond to an oxygen atom, making a carboxylic acid group here. And this is what it looks like in 3D. Here's the C double bond O and the C single bond O. Here's a little bit more complicated one. It has a ring in it. This is vitamin B6. And the ring is specified by what I'm calling ring tags. Uh, it's a bond uh, going to a tag one, and there's a matching one over here in the structure. And it actually represents, we start the structure here at carbon going to a carbon, um, uh, a ring to one side and then a double bond to a carbon. So we're starting here, going here, here's the double bond to a carbon, and this is the bond that we break and we represent it uh, with ring tags, this one with a one that points to this atom that has a one that points back to that atom. So that's how, how the atom rooted molecule works. Okay, so we can take the uh, offending combinators, the ones with too many bonds, and we can write it uh, as an atom rooted molecule. We've got a, a carbon atom with one, two, three, four, five, other carbon atoms bonded to it with single bonds. So we can define that. And the corresponding dimethyl butane, which is valid, we can write in a very similar way. Uh, we've got three uh, carbon atoms singly bonded to this one here, and then another carbon bonded to it, but it has the sixth carbon atom attached to it, and it's not attached to the center one here. Okay, so we can convert uh, combinators to this type of syntax, this uh, atom rooted molecule with these very simple rules here. We basically take the expression and give it to the arm function, which is defined here. And when that's done, we, uh, which returns a list um, at the very bottom, uh, things are returned as lists and passed back up. Uh, that list structure is then finally turned into a, a molecule object, um, that last list. The arm itself, if it sees a, a, a C, a carbon atom, it just returns right away with that carbon atom in a list. 
Uh, and then if it sees a nested structure like this, it calls arm on each part, the head and, and the body, and then glues them together with a single bond. Very, very simple. So we can try that. Let's try it on the two combinators. Uh, the bad one that had too many um, uh, S's connected to the first one and one that was okay. And we can do that um, taking those combinators, uh, making them added rooted molecules. And these are the two of them that we can see. And if we can come back, you can compare them back to the other structures, you'll see that they're they're the same. We can now convert these two molecules uh, through uh, the SMILE strings. And again, we see on the first one, we have invalid valence. And when we do it with the combinators, we get the same thing. We get a message about invalid valence. Um, and then we get a molecule object. And that's bizarre that I'm getting these generic ones here. Um, I'll have to look into that later. Um, <clears throat> okay, we're not gonna worry about these messages because now we're actually going to fix them. So back to, to, the, to the one two shift, how do we carry that out? Well, we need to define a few rules about uh, atom rooted molecules so that we can write uh, a, a function, a down value, uh, that can be used automatically to make the change. We need to define that the valence allowed for carbon is four and the valence of a single bond is one and the valence of uh, a sequence is the, the total of the valences of that sequence. And that way we can say, we can look at uh, a single construct here and we can get the valence of the atom here and uh, the valence of the ligands, A, B, and C, however many there, there might be, um, and they, we, it has to satisfy the rule that um, the, uh, the valence of the atom minus the valence of the single that it's inside of, uh, that has to be less than the valence of, of these guys here, of the pendant atoms. And uh, if that's not, if, if that is, um, uh, is that constraint is met, that means that there's excess of valence. In other words, there are too many attachments here. What we do then is we take the, uh, this atom here and we actually insert it inside of that one and return that object. And so now this atom here, whatever it was, now only has two, has this single attachment instead of two plus the rest of the sequence. And we can do the same sort of thing at the molecule level itself as well, where we take uh, one, of the, one of the attachments and put it inside the other. So that's basically shifting it down. So we'll define that. And this is the definition of the uh, molecule that has too many atoms attached to the first one. Um, and if we evaluate it, then this rule gets to work on it. And we see that um, we now have it shifted and we've only got one, two, three, four attachments to the carbon, so we're good. And we can convert that to smiles and to a molecule. And we can see that uh, we're not getting any messages and we have a valid structure. We can do the same thing to this uh, combinator itself, converting it to an atom rooted molecule and then to smiles and then to a molecule and we get a correct structure. Um, I'd already mentioned that we ignore hydrogens, that's okay. Um, you might say that, well, what if this carbon here that we moved the, the atom to already had four attachments? Well. That's fine, it has five, we just move it out one more and keep going till we get to the end of the chain. And at the end of the chain, we should be okay. Um, the downside to this method is that every single time the evaluator in, in Wolfram language gets a atom rooted molecule, it's going to check the valence and then uh, 
try to fix it if it's necessary. And even if it is good, it's not marked as good. And next time the evaluator sees it, it's going to check it again, um, which means that there's a lot of overhead in terms of excessive checking. So doing it automatically like that is really not such a great idea. And we've written a function uh, called repair molecule that's in the package that actually does the check and the repair, but does it through a set of um, delayed rules rather than down values, rather than set delayed, we're using rule delayed that we could control when it gets used. So let's clear our definitions for valence and single and molecule so that we don't interfere with what's in the package. And we'll redefine atom rooted molecule so that it does basically the same thing as before, but now the last thing it does is it takes the result, resulting molecule and gives it to repair molecule, which will check all the valences and do any other um, uh, manipulations of the structure that are necessary. So let's test it out. So here is the original uh, atom-rooted molecule that had invalid valence and it still gives the message. Now, if we take that and give it to repair molecule and then convert it, we're good. And then we can take the combinator and give it to atom rooted molecule, which calls repair molecule. And we're also good. Okay. Um, the repair molecule function does a number of things and I'm just going to skip over them uh, very quickly uh, for time. Uh, it will, uh, the first thing it tries to do is reduce bond order uh, to satisfy valence. If that doesn't work or is not sufficient by itself, then it will do the bond shifting. Uh, if that is not sufficient, then if there's a, a dangling ring closure, we'll get rid of that, preserving the rest of the structure. And if that doesn't help, and there's still too many bonds to an atom, then we have no choice but to get rid of it. Uh, for example, if this, uh, uh, the, you know, we had done the bond shift and the last atom it shifted to was something like a chlorine atom that can have only one attachment and it's already got it back into the molecule. At that point, we'd have to, you know, eliminate the, uh, the group that we shifted down onto the chlorine atom, for example. Uh, it also does some checking uh, about rings at the end to make sure we don't have any loops like this of, of a, a ring on an atom or a ring across a single bond, a lone bond like this. If we have this situation, we, we, we remove the ring and elevate the bond order. Triple bonds can't be elevated, so we just eliminate the ring. And then if there are two rings uh, closures to the same pair of atoms, uh, we just eliminate one of them. So the, the uh, ring closure tags to get removed and we're just left with one ring closure there. So th this is a deterministic uh, approach that we've taken. Uh, you know, I've chosen an order that as a chemist makes sense, but we could possibly, you know, consider doing all possible rearrangements. And then we're talking about a multi-way computation. And instead of getting just one molecule back, we'd end up getting several molecules back from a single parent molecule, but we're not going to go there today. Okay, let's see how well we do in terms of, of generating structures. Uh, as we had seen before, there's a, you know, a, a number of uh, alkanes uh, that we can generate of a given size and many more combinators uh, with the same number of symbols are possible. Um, so uh, let's see how, if, if we use these combinators and generate molecules, how, how, do they, you know, these molecules that we generate, do they look like regular molecules that we encounter out in the wild? Um, and, and we can actually test that because we can look at the Wolfram knowledge base as a collection of molecules out in the wild, as it were. So let's generate some combinators, okay, up to size 10. And we can turn them into molecules and um, let's group them uh, by size and then uh, take a look at what we've got there. Now I'm gonna stop evaluating things because everything's been evaluated already and we can just go through the notebook more quickly uh, at this point. So we've got uh, the combinators isomers that have already been generated, turned into molecules. 
Um, and um, we have them uh, arranged by size in this association here from one carbon up to 10 carbons. And we can see how often they occur with, with one carbon, there's just one choice with two and three, there's also one choice. But when we get to four, there are two possible uh, types of, of molecules that can be generated. And each one is generated once with five, there are three kinds um, and, and so on. And if we look at, you know, for example, here with the fives, the neopentane is generated twice in the iso, or the isopentane eight times and the n-pentane, uh, the straight chain one is generated four times. So we can see what the redundancy looks like. It can actually be quite high. And let's just take a look at the combinators with five symbols, which will give us uh, molecules with five carbon atoms. These are the, the smile strings that were generated. And these are the combinators that will generate n-pentane. We can see they are different combinators. They have a different hierarchical tree structure. They do generate different smile strings, but all these smile strings end up representing the same single molecule. Same for isobutane and same for neopentane. So um, how do we get molecules of, uh, with different atoms in them and with multiple bonds and rings from combinators? Um, let's take a look at the, the uh, heteroatom problem first, different atoms, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, et cetera. If we look at the definition of ARM, we see that the atom, carbon atom comes into it from uh, the, the symbol S here. So we could say, okay, let's increase our alphabet of uh, symbols. We, we don't have to use just the combinator S, we could use combinator K, combinator Y, and so on. Or we could just use letters, in fact, and generate combinator structures with those. Um, problem is when we start generating, using more symbols for more atoms, we start getting astronomical numbers of combinators possible for a relatively small number of symbols uh, in the combinator size. So that's not going to scale very well. Uh, bond types, on the other hand, here's our single bond. It comes in from the, the nesting of the combinator. And we could say then, well, okay, what if we've got you know, this type of nesting here? This gives us a single bond. This one gives us a double. This gives us a triple. But then what do we do about this sort of nesting? Okay, well, we could assign it to one of these choices here. And maybe we want to have more single bonds than, than double or triple bonds. Um, and doing it with just S combinators um, to have enough to do it, we need to go to four symbols. Uh, and then we've got some that we need to fill in. So the, this one-to-one, -one, this not one-to-one -one mapping, uh, we could probably use it to our advantage to bias the distribution. Well, why not use uh, these multiple symbol combinators uh, to represent different atoms as well as just the bonds. And we can think of doing it, uh, here's an, uh, an S combinator mapping where a single carbon, <clears throat> excuse me, a single S maps to a carbon and two S's maps to another carbon, three S's to a nitrogen, this variation of three S's to an oxygen and so on. This combinator would give us a double bond, this a triple bond, and this last one would give us a ring closure. We could do a similar sort of thing with an SK combinator mapping. We use fewer symbols, but uh, we've got to use more combinators to, to get the, um, to fill out the, uh, to make use of all of them of a given size. So we can do that. There's a function called defined feature to combinator mapping, and it will take, uh, as in the example here, this says, this, carbon atom uh, is mapped to these two combinators, a nitrogen atom to this single one and oxygen to that one. And the, we can actually uh, make a nice table of them this way here. Well, let's define that mapping. That's the old mapping. And now we can do it. 
And mapping Tableau actually looks at the definition of ARM to find out what to do. And since we, I had not defined that yet, um, it was looking at the old mapping. And, and this just recapitulates what we had seen above um, and tells us how the mapping is, is carried out. And here are the actual definitions that are used. And so let's try it out. Let's generate uh, 12 combinators of size 64. There's a random combinator function at the end of the uh, presentation notebook. Um, it's not a perfect one, but it's good enough for purposes here. And these are what the combinators look like. Okay, I have to stop evaluating things so we can save some time, but we've got a variety of structures here. And then we can generate the smile strings from those. We see we've got oxygen atoms, nitrogen atoms, chlorine atoms. Uh, we've got a one here, which means we've got a ring closure. Um, I see an equal sign. That means we've got a double bond in there. So that's good. We can convert them to molecules. Uh, and we can see from the images in the summary boxes, we've got some variety of structure there. And we can plot them in 3D. And we can see that we've got quite a bit of variety, a lot of different types of, of atoms, sulfurs, chlorines, oxygens, nitrogens. We've got rings. And uh, we should have some multiple bonds in here. Uh, they're just not showing in this one. OK. We can do the same thing with the an SK combinator mapping. And this is the mapping that was on the slide earlier. And uh, so let's just define that. And it looks like I've deleted my output. So I will have to evaluate to show you what they look like. There's the mapping. And we can generate a combinator using that mapping. And we can make the grid of 12 of them to see what they look like. We can convert them to atom rooted molecules and then to smiles. And then we can convert those to molecules. And again, quite a variety, including rings and multiple bonds. and plot them in 3D, it's a little bit easier to see what they are. Come on. Okay. So we've got some big rings, we've got two rings together in a single molecule and so on, a good variety of, of different types of atoms. We've got multiple bonds as well. So it, this you know, method does seem like it will be a feasible way of um, generating chemical structures. So let's see how we do against the uh, set of compounds that are available in Wolfram language. And um, I've done that already. Uh, I've made a list of hydrocarbons. There are almost uh, 1,500 of them. And this is the distribution of the uh, number of carbon atoms present. Uh, most of the molecules have 10. There are a few very large ones. Here are the distributions of the numbers of single bonds in the molecules uh, and double bonds, fewer of them and not as many and triple bonds are, are even more rare. We can look at uh, the connectivity of each of the atoms, how many other atoms are attached to a given atom. If there's only one, it's called a primary, at, uh, primary uh, configuration. If there are two atoms attached to it, it's secondary, all the way up to quaternary. And uh, we can see that it, you know, they've got these distributions with a, a longish tail uh, to higher numbers. Um, and then we can look at the rings uh, for the set of molecules. Uh, they uh, had from one to eight rings. Um, and the smallest ring was size three, a cyclopropane, for example. And the largest ring had 30 atoms in it. And this is the distribution of the number of rings and the ring size. Doing it with combinators, okay, using this combinator mapping, uh, the, the S combinator mapping that we had before, 
um, we generated uh, 1500 uh, combinators and converted them to molecules. I used a range of sizes. I made 900 of them with 20 symbols, 350 with 35. Uh, all the way up to 25 combinators with 125 symbols in them to get a variety of sizes. And we can see that the distribution of the atom sizes, the, the counts of atoms is very similar to what we have for uh, the real molecules. And the distribution of the types of bonds is very similar. Uh, the triple bonds are underrepresented in the combinator molecules. Uh, which is not too surprising. The arrangements around a given atom in terms of how many attachments they have are similar, but not identical. Um, we tend to have uh, uh, more uh, atoms with more attachments to them, or actually fewer attachments to them. That's what this is saying here, that we've got many more primary atoms in the combinators than we did in the real molecules. And, um, we also have many more quaternary atoms, uh, atoms with four attachments than the real molecules did. Uh, the rings, um, we did not get as large. The largest ring uh, that we generated with the combinator was only 12 atoms in it. And the, the, uh, dist you know, the distribution of sizes is very different. So we didn't do too badly uh, for a first pass. Um, now, what I wanted to get on to is, uh, you know, once I got this working, I said, gee, um, this uh, representation for molecules as a combinator is different from what we had used before. The atom-rooted molecule uh, for genetic programming, the molecule itself was the genotype, uh, or excuse me, was the genotype, as, and it was the phenotype as well. We were manipulating the chemical structure directly, rather than something like DNA and proteins, where the DNA is the genotype, where you're uh, doing crossover and mutation on nucleotide uh, sequences, um, and they get transcribed into proteins. And the genetic operators that we used for the atom-rooted molecules were very carefully crafted to mimic typical chemical structure manipulations, making a ring bigger, making it smaller, uh, changing bond orders, you know, oxidizing or reducing uh, uh, multiple bonds uh, and shifting atoms as we had seen before with a one, two shift. So there's a lot of work put into that. Whereas with uh, uh, combinators, we can just have a very simple uh, manipulation uh, with mutation and crossover. So I, what I wanted to see was, was this simpler representation uh, of combinators, is that going to be any advantage for us over the more complicated uh, atom-rooted molecule implementation that we had? So that was the, the, the goal that I wanted to, to uh, set out to answer that question. Uh, and uh, it turns out, yeah, I don't have a, a real definite answer yet. So we used the, the same SK combinator mapping, okay, that we had before. And uh, we can generate a random molecule, okay? Let's generate a random combinator. Here's one. And we can use this function here, mutate. All it does is it randomly picks some point in here and then takes that combinator at that point and changes it to something else, or maybe it's this combinator here that's chosen and changed into a different combinator of about the same size, a little bigger or a little smaller. And so we can mutate that combinator. So this is the one we made. This is the one that we mutated. It is a different structure and we can look at it and we can see that this branch over here is now smaller. And the effect then on the molecules, this is the original molecule here, and this is the resulting one. And we can see that the ring is now bigger, that we've somehow managed to magically insert another atom in here uh, by changing the branch here. So this is the type of of change that we were hoping we could do that just by manipulating the 
the genotype, we can affect a change in the phenotype as well and not have to have a lot of specially crafted operators. The crossover works in a very similar way. We can generate another random combinator and the crossover just picks two points, one in each molecule, in each uh, combinator, and then takes the, the pendant part and exchanges them. And so we can do a crossover. And these were the two original combinators here on the left. And these are the new ones here on the right. And the corresponding molecules look like this. This was the original one here. It got changed into this much bigger one. So it looks like most of this combinator <clears throat> got put into this one and very little was left over to make just an ethane molecule, CH3, CH3. Okay, so now we've got the basic pieces uh, to do uh, molecular evolution with genetic programming. Let's see if we can make a molecule of a given molecular weight. That's going to be our fitness. Um, the further away the molecular weight is of the molecule, the, the bigger the penalty. So this is our fitness function uh, using a molecular weight target. Let's gen randomly generate a molecular weight, uh, 327, and we'll generate a population of random molecules. And we can calculate the fitness on those. And this is really strange that I'm getting exactly the same results as before. No, we are getting something different. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> we can take the best one from this set, from this population and see what it looks like. And it has a molecular weight of 222. This is the structure. Um, now we can evolve it with the evolve function that takes a population of expressions and a fitness function um, and some genetic operators that will be used with these uh, weights. Uh, we'll use uh, direct uh, duplication. Um, the, more, the more fit it is, the more likely it will be chosen. Um, so 10% will be just directly copied into the new population, the new generation. 10% will be mutated and 80% uh, will be produced by crossover. And we'll do this for 50 generations. Um, I won't take the time to do that. I did it before. And um, well, actually I better do it so that I have the correct result here. It'll take about a minute to run. Um, let me see if there are any questions on the chat that I can answer. Uh, no question yet. Okay, somebody was asking about something about hydrogen bonds. Um, no, hydrogen bonds are not directly um, handled with atom-rooted molecules. And uh, that's mostly because, uh, uh, well, I, they probably could be handled. You could specify them. They wouldn't have any valence uh, to count against uh, the hydrogens. Uh, so they could be incorporated. We've just never gotten around to doing that. Okay. How do I determine which combinator form should correspond to which various other chemical elements? Um, I just basically pick them. Um, and uh, they, it turns out there are some rules you need to follow. The, the smallest combinator expressions of the ones you're going to use need to be used for atoms. And if you end up having to use uh, combinators with three symbols to cover all your atoms, then all the other three symbol combinators that you didn't use also had to be mapped to atoms. So you, you know, you'll have some uh, extra representations for maybe carbon and oxygen and not quite so many for nitrogen and sulfur, for example. And then uh, the other combinators that you use for bonds, you know, the, those have a certain number of symbols required to cover those. You have to use up the rest of the complement of the, the combinators of that many symbols for bonds as well. Um, but that's basically the recipe that you use. And then you just decide, you know, how big do you want to go? Okay, so we've evolved the population. 
it's an association that come back comes back the the best element is the fitness which is actually very high this is good and this is the combinator the list of combinators that satisfied that and it looks like we've got a couple yes we've got two different combinators that had that same fitness and they are different from each other And this is what they look like. We can convert them to molecules. And we get two different molecules out. Um, yeah, I'm confused. Ah, I didn't evaluate that. Let's evaluate that. OK, so these are the two molecules that we got. Um, they are slightly different um, since they have exactly the same uh, molecular weight. They are isomers of each other. And we were looking for something with a molecular weight of 327 and we got to 325. So we got pretty close. So the, the method of evolving structures with genetic programming against a target does work. So let's go back now and see what we could do uh, to try to redo the experiments that I did about 20 years ago with the atom-based, the atom-rooted molecules. I did two experiments there. One was trying to evolve structures to see if I could exactly uh, generate a target molecule based on a uh, atom description uh, based on not the exact atoms and bonds, but what are called atom pairs uh, and using chemical similarity, which I'll describe in just a minute. I wanted to see if I could generate these three uh, acyclic molecules that are actually homologous series of one, two, and three isoprene units. Uh, these are called isoprenoids. Uh, they make uh, things that are very fragrant. Uh, like menthol um, uh, or, or camphor. They also uh, end up making uh, molecules like cholesterol and other steroids, cortisone uh, that your body has. Um, and uh, there's a, an, a, an analogous homologous series, uh, again, of cyclic ones. And I wanted to see, uh, you know, back then the experiment was to see what's harder to generate cyclic molecules. There isn't time to go to to redo everything here. And so uh, let me just move on. Uh, the structural similarly, similarity that we're using was developed by a group at Laterly Labs uh, led by um, Carhart. Uh, and it, it uses what's called uh, an atom pair descriptor. It's based on an, the atom type, uh, the atom hybridization, the number of connections to the atoms, and the number of bonds between the two atoms in the atom pair. So this molecule here has these atom pairs. We've got one atom and two atoms, the second atom here, the number of bonds in between them, uh, the atomic symbol, the uh, number of pi electrons uh, on it, that's the hybridization, and the number of connections to the atoms. This one has three. So it's describing this atom here. And this is uh, the oxygen atom that's attached to it. Uh, it's got one pi electron, that's the double bond, and it's got uh, one atom attached to it, that's the bond there. And we've got two uh, atom pairs in the molecule that are like that. Uh, we can also look at other molecules like acetone or isobut isobutylene. They're very similar except for just one atom, but they do have a different atom pair descriptor. And we can calculate the similarity between them by using the dice similarity um, uh, and uh, it's equivalent to one minus the dissimilarity. And we can use the resource function multiset dissimilarity to calculate the dissimilarity. Um, and we subtract it from one to get the actual similarity to, to show how similar they are. So uh, the similarity runs from zero, meaning the two molecules are absolutely totally different from each other to one, which means they're identical. And so looking at the atom pairs here for acetone and isobutylene, uh, they have a similarity of one half. Uh, this computation was done on the atom pairs 
and so we've overloaded it. So if we give it a molecule, it converts it to the atom pairs and then uses that. So we can do it on molecules directly. Okay. We could have used the, the resource function. Um, oh, I haven't redefined malls. Yep. Okay. Okay. That's better. Okay. Um, we could have used the resource function molecule fingerprint similarity. <clears throat> However, it uses bit vectors and bit vectors um, don't take into account how often a given uh, fingerprint shows up or atom pair shows up in a molecule, just that it's present or absence. And it's not quite as discriminating. If we look at uh, rings, for example, from uh, three membered rings up to 12 membered rings and can compute the similarities each way, the frequency similarities and the bit similarities. Okay. We can see that uh, some molecules appear to be identical to each other. And that happens, for example, here, uh, the four membered ring, when you only consider the bits is the same as a five-membered ring. And that's because the longest distance between any two atoms uh, is only three bonds. Uh, when I look at a four-membered ring and a five-membered ring, excuse me, a five-membered ring and a six-membered ring, then the longest distance in the five-membered ring is still only two bonds. But with a six-membered ring, it's three. And therefore, this, uh, they are uh, calculated to have a different similarity. Uh, from each other. So it's not, they're not identical. So that we're going to use the, the atom pairs with frequencies. And we can compute the atom pairs for our target molecules. So they have them handy. Um, I'll skip over this part about the fitness. Um, we can calculate the fitness as the uh, atom pair uh, similarity. Do that. We can generate a random population of combinators and we can calculate the fitness uh, on those. Okay. Um, and to see what the distribution looks like. And we can pull out the best one, which is that. We can see what the structure is. And it's this, and this is the similarity to uh, the first target molecule. And actually, I'm going to skip that. I ran it earlier today, and I've got the results there uh, in this iconized result. And the best result that we had was this combinator. And we can get a look at what it is. Here's the tree structure for it. We can convert that to, to a molecule. And we can see that it has this structure here. OK. Um, and it's not quite what we were after. It has some semblance to it. Um, but not, not the actual one. Um, we can look at the next larger size. Okay. Um, it's got a, a four membered ring instead of a three membered ring. It does have two, uh, methyl groups attached to it, uh, like the target molecule did, but it, it's not the three membered ring. Um, I did the same thing here with the larger, uh, eight membered ring. And um, the result was this molecule here, uh, not very similar. Uh, oh, this was the best one from the initial population. When I evolved the population, I got one that was better. Um, and it had this structure here, a six-membered ring, 
instead of the uh, seven-membered ring. Uh, it did have two methyl groups attached to a single atom, and it did have a, a methyl group attached to an atom there like this one, but it's missing the double bond and it's missing the hydroxyl group. So not too bad. And when I did this with the larger humulol target, okay, this was the best one from the initial population that does have a hydroxyl group. Um, and looking at the result that we got, we got a 10 membered ring instead of the larger, let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten, the larger 11 membered ring. Uh, it does have a geminal dimethyl group like this. It does have a double bond, but it's not in the ring like these do. Um, it's got a, the right number of carbons, but they're, they're not arranged appropriately um, in, the, in the ring. So it didn't do too badly. Um, now, this experiment was done you know, very quickly, just as a proof of concept. Uh, we would want to go back and perhaps uh, adjust the, the probabilities that the different operators were used or run more generations or use a bigger population of combinators to start with. All those sorts of experiments should be done to try to find you know, better conditions to use them, but this does look promising. And I am over time. And so the last experiment that we did was looking for an average structure. Uh, this molecule, Pulagone, was described as being its fragrance midway between menthol and camphor. So I thought at the time this would be a good experiment to try to find something based on an average structure. And so the average structure was defined by the average of the atom pair descriptors of menthol and camphor. And uh, going through the whole thing, uh, I ended up with a molecule that looked like this. It's a little bit like camphor. It's got a five-membered ring like camphor does in a geminal dimethyl group, but we're missing an oxygen atom altogether and no multiple bonds. And again, um, probably uh, trying to uh, uh, tune some of the uh, probabilities that the prob of the uh, um, that the genetic operators were used would help, and probably uh, refining how the initial population was generated would help as well. But all in all, um, they do work. So let's just quickly jump down here, skipping over the last section. Um, so the combinator uh, method it, it did miss a lot of the hydrocarbons which is the part that I didn't show. Um, and uh, most notably there are the isomers with the fewest number of, of hydrogens present on them. Uh, they were molecules that were, had many, many rings or many multiple bonds. Um, in the, the, let's see, uh, I actually wanna go here to talk about what we did just look at. So with a genetic uh, programming based method, um, the, the mutation operator didn't generate a lot of variety. A lot of times it ended up replacing uh, a symbol with the same symbol, nothing, nothing bigger. Um, and the, the results were mixed. We didn't make any effort to, to find a better population size or combinator distribution in that population. We didn't make any effort to um, uh, see how many generations were needed to, to, to find it. I just did 200 because that was a reasonable number to try. Um, and, you know, we didn't make any effort to try to improve the probabilities that the genetic operators were used um, uh, to, 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 to make a new generation. But all in all, uh, it's a good start, uh, but more experimenting is needed. And with that, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention this afternoon. And we've got about five minutes left on the Zoom where I can answer questions. Okay. Um, okay, we already talked about hydrogen bonds. Um, let's see, do generated molecules replicate naturally, natural appearance of multiple bonds versus rings. Um, the, the experiment we did against the, the molecules in the uh, Wolfram knowledge base wasn't too bad. It, it, of course, it was not exact, 
Um, and we probably could tune the, the mapping of chemical features to combinators uh, to, to improve that. Um, that's certainly something that could be done. Um, so that's, that's certainly uh, you know, a nice project for a summer school student, for example, to look into. A uh, question from Joseph, would the, uh, an implementation of an atom and bond chirality use, yield interesting results? Yes, it most certainly would. Uh, chirality can be expressed um, in smiles, uh, strings. Uh, we could take it into account with the atom rooted molecule if we consider the order of the attachments. Right now, we ignore that order entirely. And if, if the atoms were ABC, uh, that might say it had the R configuration versus uh, BCA which would then say it had an S configuration, for example. Uh, and we could do something similarly for E and Z configurations around double bonds. Uh, I've never actually gone that far with the atom rooted molecule concept, but it could be done. Uh, let's see. And that's it. Just another question about chirality. Uh, oh, wait a minute, no, there's more here. Um, Let's see, are there families of oligomers or polymers which you would not expect to be easily modeled with combinators? Um, yeah, probably things like RNA and DNA where we've got rings you know, right down the whole backbone um, of each strand and as well as rings in the base pairs and, and multiple bonds and lots of oxygen and nitrogen atoms and phosphorus atoms as well. Uh, that would probably be, be really hard to do with combinators. It would probably be hard to do with atom-rooted molecules as well. Um, there are probably some ways around that. If we tried to model, let's say, a biosequence with a combinator, uh, that might be more successful. In other words, we would map to biosequence features instead of uh, chemistry features. So that's something uh, that could be looked into. Uh, that's actually, you know, a very nice question. Um, let's see, cyclopropane should be generated less often than hexane. I don't remember what the results were when I looked at the, the hydrocarbons. Uh, David, we can talk about that later um, and uh, we can see what's there. Okay, again, I, that's the end of the questions. Thank you for your attention. And Zoom is going to cut us off uh, just uh, in a, a few minutes. So I'll let everybody go on to their next talk. Uh, the notebook has everything in it. You should be able to run everything. Um, some of the computations in the last part I didn't cover. I did have to run in parallel and they did take several hours to run, but the code is there. Uh, so you can run it yourself and generate your own uh, full set of hydrocarbon molecules uh, to compare against combinators. And with that, I will call it a day. Thank you.